God, we live in a free nation this, this morning. We thank you for it. So we, we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray for every person that wanted to be in church this morning and couldn't be with them. And God, before we get started this morning, praise. We want to pray for our nation. God, help our nation. Help our leaders. We need your help. Let us humble ourselves before you. Smile on us once again. And for that, we give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen.
and bless the housewife, she has gone around and she is picking your job to death and you're not even half done yet. So uh, they're, they're making sticky notes. Why does the drywall look rough? Well, we want to put one coat on and it takes three coats, so be patient. And just on and on and on. So I, that's, a, that's very stressful. That's a, the man I was talking to, he's a good Christian, he goes, I am so stressed out about my jobs and what's going on and how, you know, how it just takes a toll on my life. I said, be a pastor yeah. and see how stressful that is. I mean, yeah. it's, this is more stressful than that. Like, yeah. but that was a that was a fleshly thing. This is spiritual. Right. And the devil loves to come and when you're discouraged, he wants to kick you farther into the ground. Oh, yeah. And he doesn't just kick you down. He takes his foot and he grinds you into the ground yeah. and just tries to get you to become depressed and oppressed, suppressed, all those things that he can do. So. I appreciate the kind words of Brother Dan that, you know, it is a st very stressful thing to do. Anyway, okay, if you change that slide for me, uh, Mark, I'm going to be preaching this morning if you want to turn your text to Luke, the 19th chapter and the first verse. I'm going to preach about this. Are you out on a limb? Are you out on a limb? You're probably wondering what in the world is he talking about? I don't understand why would I be out on a limb. You ever heard somebody say when they're taking a chance, when they're going to uh, do something and not really know what the outcome is, says, I'm going to go out on a limb for you. And uh, people would say, I'm going to go out on a limb. So today, I just want to know, and when, you get, when I get done with my message, I hope you will know and understand why I titled my message, Are You Out on a Limb? Amen? Uh, Luke, the 19th chapter. Verses 1 through 10. I want to read that and I want to uh, you to understand and know why we go out on them for Jesus. If we're looking for Jesus, if you are looking for Him, you will find Him. If you're looking for life abundantly and the new things of, that only God can do in your life, you've got to go out on them. You have to step out into by faith and go out on them to know that you will find Jesus. And you'll get in a situation where you know that if you get there and you find that one place where he's going to pass by, that you will find him. He will come by and you will get to have a relationship with him. I'm talking about a relationship this morning with Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. Everybody found it yet? Yes. Luke 19, chapter, and the first verse. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Which was, all right, hold on. All right, how many knows that Jack, Zacchaeus was a wee little man? How many learned in, in Sunday school? A wee little man. A wee little man was he. All right, there was a song that I learned, I learned about Zacchaeus when I was real little in, in uh, Sunday school. My Sunday school teacher, our children's church director, would get us all together, and we sang a song about Zacchaeus. And the song goes, and you guys sing it with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, his Savior for to see. And as Jesus passed by, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for today you'll sup with me. You never heard that as a kid growing up? It was a song about Zacchaeus and about him climbing up in a sycamore tree to get to see Jesus when he came through Jericho. Said he was a wee little man, so he must have been, you know, not, I'm taller than he was. I know that. So don't, get that thought out of your mind about the stature and tallness right now. Get that, get that completely out of your mind. I know he was only this tall, okay? He was a wee little man, all right? So we need to get that out of our minds, first of all. But it said he was a wee little man, and he climbed up in the tree because he wanted Jesus was coming. And he was looking for something that he didn't have. He was looking for a hope of someone that could do something for him that no man could do. I see Zacchaeus, the man that was not happy. He was, he was rich. He was a tax collector. And how many loves tax collectors? Come on, every hand should be up in this place. You just love your tax collector. If he would come to your house and say, oh, come on in. Come in and sit down. I've made you a meal. And I've got, I've got drinks and everything. Just come and, you know, we're just going to have a good chat. If the IRS come to your door, knocking on your door, you know, you're going to open up and just, you're going to welcome them and just say, come on in and you can audit me and you can take my money away. You can have it all. 
right? <laughs> Wrong. Okay, so I just want you to see that Zacchaeus was not well liked. Matter of fact, he was more or less hated by people because he's the one that when you heard a tap on your door, he was there saying your taxes are due and I'm here to collect and you better have it. If you don't have it, I'm taking, see your finest animal out there, see your, your stock, your whatever, I'm taking it away from you because you owe it and you have to pay. Okay, so he's coming to take something away from you. Well, how many knows that uh, IRS, you know, kind of maybe takes people's money away and, and, you know, all times time it's money we don't have to give. So I see Zacchaeus, one that took money, and he overcharged and overtaxed people and took their money. Okay? So I want to paint you a picture of Zacchaeus and who he was and what position he held. He was a man of authority, and he had authority when he knocked on your door. You knew that you had to obey him because he worked for the government. Okay? All right, so it says, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because of his little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, the people, listen to this, they murmured, saying that he was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. First of all, the Pharisees, the people, did have, they had no dealings with Republicans. They did have no dealings with them because they were unclean. They were defiled. Anybody that wasn't of the select of the Sanhedrin, of the court, of the Jews, was rejected. And you definitely didn't go eat with them. Okay? And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Lord Jesus, I come to you today and Jesus, I just know that, believe God, that when you looked up in that tree, that you already knew, Jesus, that Zacchaeus would be out on that land. That he would be looking for something that no one else could do but you. And Jesus, he was waiting and watching for you and anticipating you walking by so he could just see you. Not knowing that you would call him out by name. And Jesus, you would call him to come down from the tree and come and you would go to his house. And him being a sinner was not worthy, but God, you make us worthy. Him not being able to come into your kingdom until he come to know you as his personal savior, Lord, you didn't worry about that. And Lord, as you went to his house and the Holy Spirit began to work in his life through you, Jesus, I see that he changed his whole attitude and his demeanor and everything changed in him and God, he became a Christian. And it made him want to give back all that he had taken from everyone around and change his life forever. And that's what you do, Jesus. You change our lives forever. And I thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to go out on that limb today. Help us to stay on the limb that we may be able to see you and reach out to you and know that you're always there. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. First of all, I want to tell you that Zacchaeus was right in making the first steps that he had to make to get to Jesus. How many knows that we have to make the steps to get to Jesus? He ran. Many times we see people when they get in trouble or they've got trouble in their life, they don't run to the church. They run the opposite direction. They don't run to Jesus and they run to the things that they know. And if they know anybody that's got some money, the first thing they're doing is going to that person and say, I need help. I need you to help me right now. I'm in a situation and I don't have any help. And if they turn their back on them, then they go to the next thing and the next thing. And what if it doesn't work? And then they say, well, you know what? I don't have no choice. Now I've got to give Jesus a try. Amen. I want to be able to go to Jesus in the first place and say, I know where my redemption is. I know who my helper is. I know who my Jesus is, that he's got all the resources in heaven to come to my aid. I want to know that. 
Zacchaeus, like many of you, I was first exposed to Zacchaeus because I knew who he was because just a little song. It's a cute little song, but it tells me that he was looking for Jesus and we needed to look for him at a young age and be able to come to him and know that he was the one that would redeem us and save us from our sin. So that song, growing up, was small in our life, but it became large and huge in my life because I knew that I needed to get out on the limb to find Jesus. I had to step out. I had to get out. You've got to walk towards Jesus. You can't just run the other way. If Zacchaeus would not have ran and found a place because he couldn't get in because he was small of stature, but he couldn't see over the crowd, so he just knew that if I get to that tree that I know that's up the road, I can run around the people and I can get up there and I can climb up in that tree and I can get up on the limb where I can get to get a good glance at but it's just Jesus. I don't know who he is. I don't know what he does or how he does it, but I just know that if I get to Jesus, it is all going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. He had confidence just to know as a sinner, still yet, before he met Jesus, he didn't know, but he just had, he had enough faith to believe that if I can get and just see Jesus, that it'll be all right. Amen. I'm about you today, but I need to get where I can see Jesus and know that it's all right. I got to go to where I know he is, and I got to get on my knees, and I got to pray, and I got to supplicate for him to know that he is the very thing in my life that I need. Yes. You need him today. The devil come to tell us, you know what, you're your own person, you're your own man. Look at all the world. They don't serve him. They get along just fine. Go to these neighborhoods and see how they live. I mean, they've got everything. Yes, they do. But it's one day it's all going to be gone and they're going to find themselves if they don't get saved. And with all the money they got, they'll be the poorest people on earth because we're going to be rich. We're going to have a mansion in heaven because God has already prepared for us. Come on. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to tell you a little story about a guy. There was a guy that went to the doctor's office for a physical. The nurse asked him his weight. He said, I weigh 150 pounds. She had him step on the scales and she said, you weigh 200 pounds. The nurse asked, well, how tall are you? He said, six feet tall. She measured him and said, you are actually five feet five inches tall. She started taking his blood pressure and he said, how can you expect my blood pressure to be normal? I came in here as a tall, slender guy and you've already made me short and fat. <laughs> so, he said, how can my blood pressure be normal? So the world sees us in a, a light that we are. When the world looks at you, it doesn't matter what your stature is. It doesn't matter if you're seven feet tall six and a half feet tall. It doesn't matter if you're six feet tall or you're five foot four. Okay? Jesus does not care about your stature. Your stature comes when God looks at you and measures a man. The measure of man is who you are and, and not how tall you are or what you've accomplished in your life because it comes on this earth do not mean nothing to God. I don't care if you have a PhD, a, a, a GHD, an MHD. I don't care what you have. I don't care if you have a bachelor's degree. It does not matter to God. Yes, the world measures you and tells you, yes, you have accomplished everything in your life. You have arrived. You know, we, we have not arrived. We might have arrived in the place, in the workplace where we can make money, yes. And that's important in our life, but the most important thing that I can think of and the statue of man that I want to be is what God wants to see in me. The statue of man is, you know what? I want God to say, you're seven foot tall and you're bulletproof, amen? You, you just, you, you know, you're like David. You were not afraid to go out and fight the enemy. When the giant came, you were not afraid to go out and oppose him and you said, just give me my little sling and give me a rock. And you know, God, I know that you're on my side. If you be for me, who can be against me? You're a God that will not fail me. And I know if I come and I come up against an enemy, you're going to come and fight for me. I don't have to even lift a finger because when I come and oppose my enemy, God, you're going to take him down. There was times when Israel went to battle. God said, just stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. He said, you don't have to do nothing, Joshua. Don't even move. Don't even lift a finger. Don't send your men out. You stand on the side of the hillside and you can see what I can do. God would bind them. They would slash themselves up. The Philistines cut themselves to pieces with their own sword because God blinded them, made it sound like there was an army all around them. You know what they're doing? They're just swinging their swords and they're killing each other because God did that. That's what my God can do. Amen. I don't care if, if you know, you're, you're four foot tall than David. 
If they're facing the giant that's nine foot six, I don't care, he's 940 pounds, you know what? He is nothing in the sight of God. He's not a stature of man that God wants to see because he was oh, disobedient to God's word of the Philistine. He did not live for God and therefore God did not give him any authority over David. Yes, amen. Amen. The devil has no authority over you. He has no power over you. Oh, the devil's just so powerful. He's the prince of the air and he just has control of me. No, he doesn't. That's a lie from hell. He has no power or no control over you. You know what? If he does, because you let him. That's right, right. You just let him into your life and you let him come and destroy everything in your life and you let him come in. You know what I got to do? And this is what James said. Resist the devil, he shall flee. Amen. How easy is that? God made it so easy. The devil can't touch you, can't torture you, can't do nothing to you because he said, just resist him. Satan, get out of here. Satan, you got to go. You've got to leave now in the name of Jesus. You have no business here. You know what? I'm in the business of God, and you're not in God's business. You are You're an outcast. You're a demon. You're a devil. Matter of fact, you got cast out of heaven. You have no place there, and I do. Just tell him who he is. Set him in his place. Let him know that he is, he is Satan. Amen? Amen? Tell him. Remember when your kids were growing up, you ever take and put on a on the side of your casing or on a wall, and you'd take them back, you set them back, and you'd, you'd make a mark. And then this tall, you make a mark. And you put their age. Yeah. And then as time goes by, and six more months, and you take them and put them against the wall. And you mark them again, and guess what? They're tall. I mean, they might have grown two or three. Look at, look at that. You were right here, and now six months later, look, you're, you're here. I want to compare that to our Christian walk. That's good, Pastor. I want to compare that to how we look with God. And God's always putting us up against the wall. And He's always going, let me see how you've grown. And He comes and He puts a mark and He says, there's your mark. Yes. Now I want you to take that mark and when I reach a goal, I want the next time I put you up against that wall and I measure you, I want you to be six inches taller. I want you to grow to me. I don't want you to stay at that one level all the time. I want you to come and go up and up and up. And when I finally measure you, you're ten foot tall because, you know what, it's not what man sees, it's what I see. And I see you growing in me. I see you growing up and coming to the knowledge that I have given you of what I want you to have in your life. If you don't grow, it's your fault because we haven't got into our word. We haven't studied our Bible. We have not got any deeper in God. We have not given give anything to God in our life. We've just gone on the same old path, same old way, yeah. doing the same old things, and nothing's ever changing. Right. We're still at, you know, same mark when he first checked us years and years ago. We have not grown because, you know what? We do not allow ourselves to grow. All right. I heard in China, I guess you guys know this is true, but they take the children of the feet and they bind them. They wrap them up real tight and they don't, they don't want their feet to grow. I don't know why. They, they don't. And they bind their feet and they bind them up and wrap them real tight and they don't grow. When they want them to grow, they loosen it up and let them grow, but they tighten it back up and they keep them, their feet from growing. I just heard this. I hope it's true. I, 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 amen. I got a confirmation right over here. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. I feel better. All right. Alright. I want to take that and put it in our spiritual book. In our spiritual life. Our spiritual walk. I want to mark this down. Is what this happens is we take our, our lives. Our spiritual lives. And we take and we bind it up. And we hold and we wrap it. And the devil even helps us. He comes and says, here let me help you. Let me help you wind it a little tighter. Let me, let me help you get them bindings on there so you can't grow for God. And I'm going to keep you the same as you were 10 years ago. And I'm not going to loosen them bands up on you. Now, if you want to come and you want to do it, go ahead. But if you don't care to do it, and you just keep on keeping them bound up and it won't grow. Yes. We keep ourselves bound up in the same old thing. The things of life and the things that we do and what we do. We never change nothing. We never let the bindings come back off of our feet, off of our spiritual feet. And we don't let it grow because we have decided that we just want to stay in the same old place and stay the same size. Shame on us. Yes. If we don't grow, if we don't keep growing in the Lord, how is God going to look at us and say, Why, how could I be pleased with somebody?
somebody that doesn't care if next year they're the same as they are this year. Or, you know, they were the same as they were 10 years ago. They've not done nothing for me and not accomplished anything because they're just standing still. Rolling stone gathers no moss. A stone that sits idle will gather moss, it'll grow on it, and it'll just become green and terrible looking. Okay? But if that thing's moving and moving and moving, it can't, it can't get nothing on it. See, we, what we do is we allow the world to just keep coming and putting things on us. We're not moving no more. We're not making any motion. We're not doing anything. So what happens, the world just comes and we stay in one place and we're just stuck right there. What happens, the world comes and keeps applying things and putting things on us and putting things on us and we're not moving, we're not doing nothing. So what happens? We get stale, we get decayed. If water's not moving, what happens? It grows, the moss grows over top of it. It gets decayed, it gets moss, it gets terrible looking, amen? Stagnant. I don't want to be stagnant. I want to be moving for the Lord. After growth of the Lord, he is measuring us to see how much we are growing for him. But God's mark is a million miles above the highest mark of mankind. He, 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 he's, he's so high about, above us. His mind is so high about us. We can't even fathom God because our mind won't even let us. To know that he knows every single person on this earth. He knows their name. He has a mark on them. And he knows who is his and he knows who isn't. Amen? Philippians 3, 14 says, I press toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing towards the mark this morning? Are you going out on a limb for Jesus? Are you doing anything that is not the norm in your life because we get to where we just want the norm? We don't want nothing to change because it, <clears throat> it gets us out of our sink of the world and the things we do and we've got an agenda and we got a, we got a schedule to keep and we have an agenda for the day and I don't care God can't even change it oh heaven help us God can't even change my agenda for the day you know what that's saying God can't even sink the Titanic boy were they wrong weren't they they should have never said that God proved them wrong. So when you say, God can't change my agenda today, God, you just don't mess with my business today because you know that I'm, I work from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. God, do not come and try to disturb me. I just don't have time today. But you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to make up for it. God says, no, you're not. You got the same schedule every day and you keep the same schedule day after day after day, week after week after week, year after year after year, and you have not changed your schedule for me. So you're not going to do it tomorrow. Oh, boy, that's tough, isn't it? That's hard. But that, you know what? We get to that point where nothing can change our schedule. I mean, nothing can change us from watching our same show because, you know, God said, go pray. Well, as soon as this show's over, I will. As soon as I get done doing this, I will. I, I've got to go to the store I'll will when I come back. You know, I've got to go do this, and when I come back, I'll do it. No, you won't. We get so busy and wrapped up in what we want. Amen. And God can't interfere. He won't interfere. Here's Zacchaeus. Climbing up into the sycamore tree. Getting up to where he can see Jesus because he just wanted to get close to him. Are we wanting to get close to Jesus today? Are we climbing up to where we can get above the, all the noise of the world? Climbing up where we can get out of the buzz of everything. Are we climbing up out of the miry clay to get where God is? Are we climbing up to get view of God because the world, when we're in the world, you can't see them. People today can't see God. Their eyes are blinded because they're not getting up out of the world and getting out of the sin and out of the things of the world today to get to where they can actually see Jesus. Yes. Zacchaeus got up there where he could get a good glimpse and see Jesus coming. Yes. He saw where he was at. And he anticipated him coming. And I'm sure that he was out on that limb. And he was getting out where he could just really know that when he, Jesus came, that he could just maybe reach out. Oh, if I could just touch him. Yeah. If I could just put my hand on him. If I could just get close enough to him. He didn't even expect to be able to talk to Jesus and to be able to have him come to his house. He just wanted to get a relationship to where he could just feel him and touch him. I want a relationship where I can feel him and touch him. I want a relationship where I know he's close 
as the mission of his name. I want to know that Jesus is always there. At any time I want to touch him, I can. Yes. You can touch Jesus any time you want. Yes. Yes. The problem is that people don't want to touch him because they don't want to take the time. Right. They are so busy with their schedule and everything they're doing, and they don't want to touch Jesus. That's right, That's because it costs them something. We all fall short of God's standards. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. That's talking about everyone in this building. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. But the biggest thing that we know and have to know that we have come out from the world and separate ourselves, we are unequally yoked with non-believers. We do not hang out with them. That's right. And then we have separated ourselves from the world. Yes. Jesus Christ, He has a name that is above every other name. The first step in salvation is recognize that in our own goodness, we will never measure up. We will never come to the stature of man that God wants us to be until we have decided that, you know what, Billy Graham is 100 feet tall. We look at people in their lives that have not changed and they have kept their standards for God. And they have done, they went out when they were sick, when they didn't feel like it. They have preached to the people they didn't want to preach to or go to places they didn't want to go. People, missionaries that go to other countries that don't want to go, but they've got a calling on their life, and God has called them out and told them, and they know it's God saying, you've got to go. And they have went. That's the ones that God said, I, you're a hundred foot tall. Your stature is so tall with me, and you know what? I measure you as a man that's after my own heart, just like David. Yes. Amen? Amen? Zachary is rich, but he wasn't happy. He was rich, but he was not happy. Money cannot buy you happy. Amen. I want to just, you know, it's a sad, sad thing. What, what happened to Robin Williams? It's very sad what he did. He had money. He had fame. People loved him. Everywhere he went, people would flock to see him because he was a celebrity. But see, he couldn't deal with his life because he wasn't happy. The things in his life made him sad. Even though he could make you laugh anywhere, everywhere he went, he made people laugh. He could make them laugh, but inside he was not laughing. Right, right. He could come up with the funniest jokes. He could find the funniest circumstances to make everybody around him just laugh. And he could do character after character, and he could get in character, out of character, but yet in his life he was not happy. People didn't recognize when they saw him because he just seemed like a happy guy. But he took his life because he could not cope with the unhappiness in his life. Zacchaeus might have been at the point of his life where he said, I can't deal with my life anymore. If something doesn't change, I might as well just kill myself. Everybody hates me. I've got to go collect taxes. And when I go to that house, they don't want me there. The people want me gone. I walk down the street, people shun me. They won't talk to me. I have no friends. I got to go home just to get somebody to talk to me. And my wife don't even like me. My kids hate me. He didn't have no happiness. There was something missing in his life. He had he had things missing. If we don't have Jesus Christ, we're going to have things missing in our life. Our life will never be the same without yeah, Jesus. That's right. You're going to have all the things that you once had. They're going to be missing. And you're going to long for them until we get back in the right spirit and the contrite heart. God, God is not going to deal with us. He will not. The details of this story reveal he was a desperate man. He was very desperate to have to climb up there and get to see Jesus. He was rich and dignified, yet he ran down the road to get in position. Desperate people run to many places. Desperate people will run to the bars and they will get the bottle, get the glass. They will down as many as they can to try to drown their sorrows. See, but there's only one problem with that. When they sober back up, the problem is still there. In fact, it's even worse because now they have a bad headache. They're sick. They don't feel good. They're, they're just sicker than they were before they drank from the bar. When they get downtrodden and depressed and everything happens and they don't know what else to do, they will turn to the bottle. I'm talking about a pill bottle. 
pills that are designed by these manufacturers and doctors have put their brains to the test to come up with a medicine that helps people, but yet people will come and abuse that drug and use it for something that is not intended for them. And they will abuse them pills to try to get their mind off of their problems, but when they come back off of it, guess what? Their problem is there, and matter of fact, it's even worse than when they took the pills. Because now they become addicted to the pills, and they're addicted to that, and they can't come off of it. I want to be addicted to Jesus. I want him to be that pill bottle that I go to every time I have a problem. Every time something arises and a storm comes in my life, I want to go to that bottle, I want to open that up, and I'm going to say, I'm going to take me a couple of Jesus pills. And I'm going to get that into my system, and guess what? It's going to cure everything in my life, and I'm not going to get sick, and I'm not going to get addicted to any pill, but this pill, I'll never, I'll get addicted to it, but I'll have to have it every single day more and more, and I'm going to take more pills and more pills of Jesus, because that's my pill. I don't know about you, but my pill is Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't care if your my pill is not your bottle is not Jack Daniels, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, I don't have those things, and I'm not using them as a crutch in my life. And how in the world these people get to that place where they have to have that crutch just to get by? I mean, they're drinking energy drinks like it's going out of style because they got to have all that caffeine in their system just to get by every day. You know what? I'm 61 years old and I have all the energy I need without taking anything. I don't need all that. I don't understand it. These young kids walking around with big old monster drinks, energy drinks, and sucking them down because it's got all that caffeine in it. Why? Why do they need all that? I don't understand. I really don't. Desperate people run to many, many times away from Jesus rather than run towards him. Zachary was very rich, but his money could not give him the peace and happiness that he was looking for. It just can't buy happiness. It can't. You can have all the money in the world and be the most miserable person in the world. He probably didn't even know what he needed. He just knew he desperately needed something. When he heard Jesus was in town, he was hoping Jesus might have the solution to his problem. He didn't know, but you know what? He was looking for God. He just heard about this Jesus. And he heard about how he had healed people and what he could do and the power he had. And he was just hoping for a glimpse of him just so he could see what he was all about. The thing is, if you get too close to Jesus, he's going to get all over you. That's right. You get too close to the Holy Spirit, he's going to get all over you. You get into the church and on the pew, the Holy Spirit's going to get all over you. Conviction will come in your life and you're going to start feeling a change. And you know, you can either run away and get away from it, and many people do. They will run out the back door because they start feeling the conviction to God. And you know what it does? It deals with their sin. Yes. They don't like it. Because they know that when they walk back out, if they give their heart to Jesus Christ and come to the altar, that things have to change. Yes. They got to give up that pill bottle. They got to give up that alcohol. Right. They got to give up those things that's in their life that they don't want to give up. And they just, they don't want to do it. Right. Right. They don't want to let go of it. We have to let go of all those things. A lot of people think that they're rich, they would have happiness and peace. If I was just, if I was just rich, I, I, I would have a care in the world. Yes, you would. Everybody thinks that every time they get a clearinghouse sweepstakes check in the mail, that they're going to hit the big one. They're, they're, they're going to be a millionaire. <laughs> Pappy, every time he gets one, he, he calls me and says, hey, I got, I got, look, there's a big check. Pappy, that's not real. You, that's all right. Did you have to send money in? Yeah. That's, Pappy, don't do it. That's not real. That's fake. They're, they can manufacture them letters all day long. If they can get people to send them $20, they get a million people to send them $20. They got $20 million. Do you understand that, Pappy? He goes, yeah. So he quit doing that. He was doing it for a long time and sending them money and checks. I was like, stop doing that. That's not real. But look, it's an official check. It's got my name on it. It's got these numbers. And look, I said, Pappy, I can go into my computer and make you one up. If you feel good about it, I'm going to make you 100 of them and just bring them and put them right here. And I'll make it for bigger checks than that if you want. I can go on my computer and manufacture that too and make it for you. Make it free. <laughs> Amen. So everybody, that, every time they get a clearinghouse sweet check letter in the mail, they think they hit the job. This is what happened. A funny thing happened a couple of years ago. The computer, computer generates them. You know that with your name on it. It just hits and it got your name and they put that on it. Every place that says, you know, you have one Harold Stiffler. 
You're going to be a millionaire, Harold Stifler. You have won the big jackpot, Harold Stifler. All right? It says, a funny thing happened a couple of years ago. The computer generated a personal letter to the Bushnell Assembly of God Church near Tampa, Florida. The church got a letter that said, Dear God of Bushnell Assembly, God, we've been looking for you. You are a finalist to receive our $11 million sweepstakes, so just don't sit there, God. Return your sweepstakes form today. The Tampa Tribune interviewed the pastor who said he didn't plan on returning the form because God already had at least $11 million already. <laughs> so even the computer generated a name, just pulled it out and said God, so they sent the sweepstakes to God. Fill out your form, God, and send it back in today so you can get your $11 million. You know what? God would laugh at that. He's got zillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. He'd say, you know what? I don't need your earthly money because I have all the heaven and I have the splendor of heaven and everything that's here. I have more gold in heaven than anybody's ever seen. You can accumulate all the gold on earth and not even come up with even a fraction of what I have. That's right. Amen? Amen. People there are looking for something. And they are looking in the wrong places. They are looking for, the song goes, looking for love in all the wrong places. Amen? Amen? They are looking for love in the wrong places. And they will try to go to bars to find love. They will go to all the places I've been telling you, to the, to the bar. They will go to the pill bar. They will go to many different things and they will find people that can just give them love. And they can go out and they can go into the streets and they can pay out all their hard-earned money to find love. It's not love, honey, it's lust. And it doesn't last but a little bit. It's over and your money is gone. And then you say, why did I do that? What good did that do me? Because now, you know what, they're gone and I'm lonely again. I'm right back to where I was and I just spent all my money on that. And now where am I at? I gave it all out and now I can't get it back. And what have I done? They're just more miserable and more lonely than they were before they even went to the streets to find that love. Amen? Amen. If we're trying to find love in places that we think is going to be there and think that He can just give us happiness, we're wrong because that's not going to last but a season. Amen? Amen. That's going to be gone. They look for it in money, human relationships, in a career. When those things don't really satisfy, they may get out on a limb and start looking for it in extreme living, which includes drugs, alcohol, sex, or anything that gives them a brief high. Are we like Zacchaeus? Are we desperate looking for something that doesn't matter? No, we just know that if we get to it and we know that it's Jesus, it's going to be all right. Jesus is here today and he can be the end of your search if you're just looking for him. Because he's been looking for you way before you looked for him, Sister Karen. He's been watching for you before you even knew that he was watching you. Before you come into existence, he knew who you were and what you were going to be. He had already measured your stature and he knows by the end of our life how tall we're going to be in his sight or how short we're going to be in the world's sight. How much we've accomplished for him and how much we have not. God knows our every move. He knows the intent of your heart. He knows what you're thinking before you think it. See, He knows what we're going to do before we do it. That's why God doesn't ever put a burden on you can't bear because He knows the stress and the load that you can take and He knows how far you go and where you won't go. This book right here will take you as far as you want to go. It'll give you all that you can handle. It will take you and it'll put you in the right place. It's going to put you up in that sycamore tree. It's going to put you out there on the limb to where people are going to go by and you're going to be there to be able to tell them, hey, do you know my Jesus? Do you know my Lord? Look, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that you are miserable. You are wretched. You don't know which way to turn. You might be contemplating suicide. You might not want to even live another day, but you know what? Let me tell you about a man that will make you want to live for eternity. And it'll live, you'll live through this life and he'll give you purpose. He'll give you a purpose and a plan. He'll give you a life that's life everlasting and abundant. Let me tell you about my Jesus. you got to get out on that limb and you got to step out on the limb sometimes when God tells you to. You can't just stay down where you're at because you're in the miry clay and you're not getting out to where Jesus can use you and you're not getting out on that limb. Be like Zacchaeus. Take a chance and get out on the limb to see Jesus. Get out on that limb. 
Luke 19.10, it's up on the board. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He come to save the lost. He come for no other reason than to come and die for your sin that you may be able to be found. Before the Gentiles could not be found in God and God did not recognize them at all until Jesus Christ came. From the day he died on the cross and his blood touched the ground, it made it so that his blood was sufficient for all the sins of the whole world. And therefore he come and had to teach his disciples that, you know what, what I have made clean, I have made clean. He had to tell Peter that, you know what, I have made clean is clean. And you cannot look at them as dirty no more. And those things I've cleaned up and made right, and that's you and me. He said, I have made them clean enough that they may come into my kingdom. And then he had to take Saul, and he had to knock him off his animal, and he had to bind him for three days. And he had to take him and show him in Damascus what was going on and what he needed to be for the Gentiles, that the blood of Jesus Christ therefore came and made him a, a minister to the Gentiles, they may be saved. Look what God can do if you get out of the limb for him. Paul had to go out on a limb because people hated him. They didn't trust him. They didn't want to. They just they ran the other way. They seen, they seen Saul coming. They ran the other way. Matter of fact, the Christians, even when they saw him, oh, he's the one that's killing the, the Jews. He's killing us. He hates the Christians. No, he's converted. Oh, no, God, you better tell me he's converted. Rather, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Because he's going to take me and get, he's going to kill me. See, Saul had to have a conversion in his life. He had to get out on the limb. He had to get out on the limb where Jesus was and to believe upon him. And Jesus came and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou my church? Why do you persecute my church? You know what, what else Saul said to him? Lord, Lord, I didn't know. I didn't know I was. See, he met Jesus that day just like Zacchaeus did. And he was up on his horse, up on a limb. And he was up on a higher place where the guys on the ground didn't see what was going on. There were people around him, but he was going through something and he was seeing a vision of everything. And God was just opened up and revealed it to just him. And he blinded him because of this reason. People say, why did, why did Paul get blinded? God closed off all his sight to the whole world around him. God shut him out of the world and just wanted him to see what he wanted him to see. Here's our problem. Let me, let me get down and tell you what it is. Our problem is that we see the picture of the world around us. And we see all the wars. We see all the things going on around our world and it, it just downtrods us. It makes us worry about our lives. And he wanted... Saul, which was Paul now, to see just him. Just to see what he wanted to see, so he blinded him. Now, that was a physical blinding where his eyes could not see no more. had no light coming in his eyes. But I believe, and I know this, that when God did, that he opened up a world to, to Paul and a vision to Paul that Paul went, Oh my God. Oh my Jesus. Oh my Lord. He saw him high and lifted up. He saw him sitting on the throne of the right hand of God. He saw Jesus as who he was. He saw that he was the one that came and was crucified on the cross of Paul. Paul at that time said, he's not the Lord. He's not God's son. He was born of a car. He was born of a, of a Mary. She's earthly. How could he be Jesus? How could he be the son of God? He didn't come the way that we thought he would. He didn't come. He was born in a manger. He, he's not Jesus. There's no way. God, I'm killing all these Christians because they're blaspheming you. So I'm going to put them all to their death because of this Jesus. And God blinded me. opened up his eyes. When he did, he saw Jesus sitting on the throne. He saw Jesus for who he was. And he saw him that he was high and lifted up. And God had exalted him to the right hand of him. And he knew who he was. And he came to the realization that, oh, Jesus. He fell on his knees before God. And he worshipped Jesus. And he said, oh, Jesus. How can I have been so wrong? And for three days, God took him and took him to the third heaven. He said, he took me to the third heaven. 
And he revealed unto him all the things that we don't even know everything that he was revealed. But God took him and showed him all heaven. And Paul got to walk through heavenly places. And God showed him all the things. And he said, you know what? Because you were out, you went out on that limb. And you see Jesus now. How can you ever be the same? When God put him back to Damascus and they took him and they showed him the things and said, this is now Paul, our brother. And he's come to be a evangelist, a pastor, a teacher for the Gentiles. They just still didn't want to accept him because they were afraid of him. You know what? I don't know about you, but I know that Jesus doesn't make any mistakes. He had a plan for Apostle Paul Saul when he was a child. And he knew what he would do and be raised up in a home that they were Pharisees. They lived by the law and he was taught the law. But God knew the day that he would blind him on the road to Damascus and change his life forever, he would be different. Just like the day that he knew that Zacchaeus would be up in the sycamore tree, and he would be, his life would be changed forever. Now it doesn't go on to tell us that Zacchaeus became a great minister. It doesn't tell us that he was a, he was a, you know, a teacher, a scholar, or an evangelist, or a preacher. It doesn't tell us that. In fact, he went on his life just like he was. But you know what? The biggest thing that God knew? He was saved. The biggest thing that he knew that he changed his life. And his life was changed after he saw Jesus. If you have an encounter with Jesus, you'll never be the same. Amen? Amen. Now Apostle Paul, God, he, God measured him and and Zacchaeus might have still stayed four foot tall to God. And his, he didn't rise up and grow with God. But Paul did. And he knows who's going to and he knows who isn't. So if you're not growing, it's your fault. Because God has already measured you ten foot tall and you're staying the height you are. You have not grown. Amen? He came to seek out and save all that Zacchaeus, like you and me, Jesus Christ, on the, came on the greatest search and rescue mission in history. He came to search that which was lost. Zachary was lost. He was lost. Jesus came all the way from heaven to find him and help him. Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. He would be arrested and crucified just a few days after he visited Jericho. But on his way to the cross, he stopped in Jericho to seek out a short tax collector named Zacchaeus. Why? Because he was desperately seeking God. He's seeking you today too. The way Jesus relates to Zacchaeus is the same way he wants to relate to you. He wants you to seek him. The first word Jesus spoke to Zacchaeus, he called him by his name. He said, Zacchaeus. I'm sure Zacchaeus probably fell off that limb when he said that. He's probably like, how, how do you know my name? How do you know I'm Zacchaeus? How did you know that? And then it probably clicked, oh, but he's Jesus. He knows everything. He can do all things. You don't have to wear a name tag for God. He already knows your name. You don't have to wear a name tag around saying, hey, God, it's, it's me. It's Pastor Rick. Ron wears one around and says, God, it's Ron. Janelle's got hers. This is Janelle. God, Janelle. Hey, Janelle, it's Janelle. Come on. Speak to me, God. It's Janelle. He knows who you are before you even go to speak to him. You open your mouth and you go into prayer. He knows what you're going to pray about. He knows what your needs are before you even know he's already made a way. He knows what you're going to pray for the day, or the week, or the month, or a year before you even pray for it. God has all the opportunity in the world to prepare your prayer and bring it back to you then to prayer because he's already knew about it for ages. He knew about it before you were born. He already knew, Ron, what you need. He knows how to be there for you. Amen? Amen. He didn't see what everyone else saw when Jesus looked at him up in that tree. He didn't look at Zacchaeus the way that other people did. They didn't like him. They hated him. They criticized him. They called him a liar, cheater, stealer. Because that's what he was. That's what he did to the people. He stole from them. He lied to them. He cheated them. Jesus didn't see that. He didn't see what everyone else saw. Do you know what the name Zacchaeus means? God knew this before when he was named Zacchaeus by his mother. It means pure. Jesus didn't see a crooked tax that he saw a man who could become pure. 
when he saw you and your sin and when you were running the bars and doing whatever you did when you were younger and doing the things you knew you shouldn't do, you were you had two bottles in your hand and you had a pill bottle and well, an alcohol bottle. And you just didn't let go of neither one of them. God knew that you were gonna who you were gonna be when you had that in your hand, and people would go, ooh, that, they're not going to heaven. Look at them. There's no way that God can take them and have a look at them. But God said, but I, you see who they are, but I don't know who they're going to be. Right. See, he knew who Zacchaeus was going to be. Yes. Are you willing to be a tree to lift people above the crowd so they can see Jesus? Come on. Let's put it on, the, on another perspective. Can, are you going to be the tree? Yes. Will you be the tree that is set and planted for God where he wants to put it? He takes that tree and he plants it where he wants it that people can climb up on the limbs and you're the tree and you have the limbs and they can climb up on you to see Jesus and they know that if they just get to you that they know they can reach Jesus from that tree and you are always in this right place in the place they know you're going to be because you shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Come on. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. We can't be moved all the time. We've got to be able to be steadfast for Jesus Christ every time the wind blows. You know what trees do? They go in and they grow big, long roots to go down in the ground. And they get deeper rooted. And every time the storm comes, that storm will come and try to blow that tree over. But you know what? It's grew, it grew the main heart root down in the ground. And it's anchored itself in the ground and it can't be torn out of the ground easily. It can't be blown over. We've got to be that tree that's planted and rooted deep into Jesus Christ into what He wants. They go, we have the power when the wind comes, the storms come, when the devil comes. We cannot be moved. Yeah. Amen? We've got to be steadfast. We've got to be that tree for people. We've got to be strong. And, and when that time comes when they need you, they can climb up on that limb and they can know that they've got help. Be that limb. Be that tree. Be that one that's planted with Jesus. Amen? Amen. I realized a long time ago, I realized this. The trees not only are there for good looks, they grow fruit. There's a lot of pretty trees that don't have fruit. There are Christians that are just trees. And they're they're okay, they're a good tree, Emma. I mean there's nothing nothing different about another Christian that's a tree. And we're all trees. Some trees will bear fruit and have fruit on them. And they will have beautiful fruit. And people just, everybody sees the fruit and says, man, boy, that rock, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit on this tree. Look at that. He's got all the fruit. And they'd be desirous, they come desirous of that and they want it also. And they, they come to you and say, hey tree, how do I get fruit like you on my tree? And it's easy to say, Jesus Christ. Didn't you know Jesus can give you all the fruit you need? He has the fruit of the Spirit. Just go and, and get it. And he goes to Kara's tree and says, Man, the gifts, all the gifts are on that tree. Look at all the gifts. She's got all the gifts. And they say, We want the gifts. How? Sister Karen, how do we get the gifts on your tree? How do we get those? Get into Jesus. Jesus. Get into Jesus. So I realize that we're all going to be a tree for Jesus if we're planted and rooted grounded then we're not going to be easily tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Yes. Amen? Yes. We're going to be planted on a solid foundation because we're with Jesus and we're planted. But trees will have different things on them and I want my tree to have the gifts. I want the fruit. I want everything to be on that tree that people look at and say, wow, Amen. God has really blessed that tree. God is blessing that You know, our job is to be that tree for people. We, can save, we can't save people. Only Jesus can. Yes. But we can lead them to the tree where they can climb up in the tree and find Jesus. 
What would have happened to Zacchaeus if there hadn't been a tree there that day? Let me tell you. God had planted that tree and put that sycamore tree exactly by that road. He knew. See, listen. The tree might have been put there a hundred years ago, planted. Because God planted this tree because he knew that one day there would be a road leading through Jericho. And that road would come right beside that tree. And they would make a road, and that would be the main path for everybody to travel. But that tree was right there. It was already prepared because he knew the tree had to be there for the road to be put next to the tree, that the limb would, the right limb had to grow out of it and go out over the road for Zacchaeus to be able to come a hundred years later. And here comes Jesus. And for Zacchaeus to be able to run to know, and he knew that he said, I, I know where there's a tree. I know there's a sycamore tree up the road and it has a real low limb. They have low limbs that grew out and went up. That I can jump on that limb, being a small man, I can climb up that limb and I can get right there where I can see Jesus. God had that all orchestrated and planned before Jesus ever even decided to go through Jericho and God sent him the right place to be the right place for Zacchaeus. See what God will do in your life? He will plant a tree where you need it. He will put a road where you need it. He will put a door, Sister Janelle, where you need it. He will put everything on the other side of that door that you need when you get there. God prepares the way before us. We've got to be smart enough to know that if we just step out by faith and go out on a limb, you know what? That God has already been there. God has already prepared it and it's safe to walk out there on that limb and you're not going to fall. He's not going to let you get hurt. He's not going to let anything happen to you. Because God is your protector. He's your provider. Amen? Amen. The good news is that God had planted a tree just in the right spot so Zacchaeus could see Jesus. Has God planted you somewhere that it seems your job is to simply lift someone up so they can see Jesus also? So are you out on a limb for Jesus to help him seek and save that which is lost? Are you? Or are we just busy about our business and our everyday life and our everyday problems that we can't even get out on a limb to see Jesus? We don't even care if we go. We're not going to climb that tree. We're not going to go up there. You know what, God? You know what? I'm not going up on that tree. I don't climb Jesus. You don't have to climb the tree if you don't want to. Today I want to climb that tree. I want to climb higher and higher every day to see Jesus. You know, if you got in the rainforest and you got in there and you were trying to get out, you didn't know which way to go. You were lost. You didn't have no direction, no compass whatsoever. But see, the rainforest, they all, they all grow the same height and they have a plateau, a big, huge top on them. And if you would get in a tree and find a tree that had lots of limbs, you could climb that tree and you, as you climb higher. As you keep going up, you can see more clearly. And you can get a view of things around you once didn't have. And when you get to the very top, guess what? If there's a city over here, you can see it. If there's a river over there, you can see it. If there's a mountain over there, you can see it. If you see things or you see people moving over there, say, ah, all I'm going to do is go down, and if I go that way, I'm going to head to safety. I'm going to get to safety because now I can see. If we would just get out of the world, we would climb up on top of that tree, we could see Jesus more clearly. We would have a vision of what God wants from life. We would see that city. We would see Emmett. We would see the thing that has to know it's going to be okay. We can have a vision that God is going to say, Emma, just climb top of that tree and stay there and don't you move because, you know what? I'm going to show you some things. I'm going to give you a vision and show you what you can't see when you're down here and down, down where the devil is, down where the world is, down where the sin is, down where everything's happening. Get up out of it and I'll show you. So I will tell you today that God says, get out of your circumstances. Get out and get up on the limb where you can see. We've been down on the ground too long. We've been down in the world too long. Let's get out. Let's get out and do something for Jesus. Get out on the limb today. Amen. I'm going to close at that. You're probably glad. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you just one, 
this is a true story that happened. We were building a church in, out in Urban Crest, and I was, I think I was like 22, 24 years old. We were building a church in Urban Crest, and it was all wood frame. We had built the walls, had it up, and we put the trusses on, and we were sheeting the roof with plywood. And uh, there was a man, Pappy knows, his name was Roger Christman. And he was working with us, and we had, we had every other sheet we had let hang over four foot, and then you go back and cut them off. You just chalk a line, and you go back and you cut, cut the sides off and let them drop on the ground because you had to trim the edge of the roof. So we started at the bottom, and your first sheet is even, and the next sheet's odd. It's, a, it's overhangs. Next sheet's even because you've got to split your sheets. You don't put, the, you don't put the joints. It makes it weak if you put them all on the same truss. So you've got to alternate them. So we alternate them, short, even sheet, hangover. Even sheet all the way up the roof line. We chopped it, got it ready. Roger got the saw out there ready to cut it. I was went to do something else. I was busy. I was up on the other side of the roof and I'm working, nailing the top of the roof off and I, I look over, I hear the saw running and I glance over. He's on the outside of the plywood, cutting. So here's the roof, here's the overhang on the plywood. He's out here because he was left-handed. He was, it made it easier for the cut because if it had been this way, it was going down him. So he got out on the plywood. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. He got out on the plywood and he's cutting. I see him, I start yelling, Roger, Roger, no, crash. He got halfway through and it broke. Down he went, about 15, 20 feet. The lucky thing was he didn't even get hurt because before that they had backed up a truckload of sand for the, to do the, it was a brick building so they were getting ready and they backed up and dumped him, a big truckload of sand there. And he came down and landed in the sand, they didn't even get a scratch on him. But he got on the outside, on the wrong side of the plywood, and it became dangerous. And he cut his own self off the roof. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Are we cutting ourselves off the roof today? Are we on the other side, on the wrong side of the plywood? Are we on the other side of the chalk line? Wow. Would, we should have been on the safe side of the chalk line, and we would have been all right. You know, we could cut that off, and we could just cut and let the sheets drop. There's no danger, but he got out into danger. Amen? That's, that's a true story. Anyway, I, I, when I was preparing this message, the Lord brought that to my mind. That's been 35 years ago. God, boy, I don't think I had one. I just thought I didn't have a mind to think that. My thinking's not as good as it needs to be. My memory. Anyway, leaving it back, I just want to leave you with the thought this week as we go through our week. How far are we willing to go for Jesus? Are we willing to go out on a limb for him? Are we going to go out on a limb to find him? Because that's not just sitting in our chair at home. That's not just sitting there doing nothing and doing what we want. That's not just sitting there and watching the shows that we like to watch and entertaining ourselves with the world, worldly things. It's entertaining ourselves in godly and spiritual things. And that's going out on a limb. Because you will have to go out on that limb to do it because the devil's going to say, don't climb that tree. You don't, you don't climb trees. You don't want to get in that tree. And it's going to go against your brain because it goes against the spirit. And the flesh will rule. Amen? So go out on the limb this week. I'm just going to say, I'm going to go out on the limb this week. I'm going out on that limb. And I'm going to get out there to where I can see Jesus. I mean, I haven't seen him for a long time, and I'm going to go see Jesus. And when he passes by, I'm going to know he's there because he's going to look up and say, Rick, come down that tree for we're going to, we're going to sup together. And I'm on a Holy Ghost fit. Right in my bed. Amen? And uh, Cheryl goes, what is he doing? The Holy Ghost came in. We're, we're just, we're having, we're having a meal. We're eating together. Amen? So, anybody, let's all stand. We're going to close. Anybody need uh, prayer this morning? On the streets of glory, let me live. Amen. We will too. Anybody need prayer this morning? I want you to be in prayer for uh, James. He's home from the hospital, but he said he's still feeling pretty bad. He's just wasn't able to come to church this morning. Linda had surgery. Uh, so Johnny and Linda, keep praying for Linda and Johnny. Uh, God keeps healing her and touching her. She, she goes through a lot. Everybody, nobody even knows what she goes through. I mean, she has 
very, very bad sickness and cancer. And she's fighting and she's been fighting for years. And she has to keep going to have more surgeries and more surgeries just to try to, you know, keep up with what's going on in her life. So keep praying for her. And uh, Danny and Lance were coming tomorrow, but they're not here, so I don't know what happened. Just pray for them. Uh, Steve and Donna's not here. Donna's had a really, really bad uh, flu virus. And uh, she's been very sick. They know what it's all about. So there's a lot of sick people this morning that's not here. And uh, God continues to just touch. You know, and this is, you know what? This is God's church. This is not my church. I ne if I ever say my church, smack me right on the, knock me on the head or something. It's not my church. It's your church. It's our church. It's God's church. This is God's church. And I want to be a good steward over God's church. And I'm trying to be. And sometimes it's very discouraging. It is. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, and I just keep the faith because I know that God's faithful. And I just know that somehow God's going to God's gonna do a miracle. He's going to do things here that we... And, you know, the devil's fighting tooth and nail. Because he doesn't want to see, once we let go and let the Holy Ghost, and we come in one line and one court. I mean, I want to see people shouting. I want to see them running these aisles. I want to see Jericho yes. march. I want to see people getting the Holy Ghost. I mean, speaking other tongues like, yes. wow, what's that? Come on now, it's been around for over 2,000 years. Right. Remember they went to the upper chamber and they got it? It's, it's still here. It hasn't went nowhere. It's for us. I want to see people healed. I want to see healings right here. Mm. I want to see people healed. I want to see lives transformed. I want to see marriages completely healed and touched and made whole. I want to see people just have a move of the Holy Ghost. Last days, God's still ready to pour out His Spirit if we'll let Him. Amen. 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 But we have to let Him. So do that. Please pray about this. Pray about all the people that's not here. Anybody need prayer this morning? I don't want to miss anybody. If you need prayer. Anybody? Good. Everybody's healthy and we'll be here next Sunday. <laughs> Everybody's good. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
God like 